What's good, everybody? My fault, y'all. What's good, y'all? It's your boy, Jet Ski Chuck. Back with another reaction to creepy and scary TikToks that might just melt your whole reality. If you haven't already, hit that like and subscribe button. Today, we're diving deep on these waters. Let's go. Watch the full video. Deep analysis on Breaking ancient bells, bells near the end of the video. Definitely don't The reptilians miss. couldn't shape shit. Because of the frequency of the bells. They couldn't stop them. They got these giants running around. Winging these bells. The reptilians can't shape shift. In the archives at the Vatican, five miles of archives underground. You can't just go, oh, I'm going to go check out the archives underground. No, you have to be a security cleared, almost top secret cleared based on their standards to get down there. Down there also, according to even some Jesuits, are bones of actual quote unquote alien beings. Mm -hmm. uh, information about uh, advanced beings that visited this planet, the Anunnaki. They have all these relics and artifacts. They have information even out of Iraq that shows and proves that advanced races had lived on this planet long before this current civilization here exists. Um, wow, what if they got Gilgamesh in there? We're talking about eons and eons ago, super highly advanced with technologies and capabilities of flight and everything else, weapons of war that existed. All that information is stored underneath the Vatican archives, along with some of the most incredible texts and books and inventions that ever existed on this planet and they siphon it away and they're hoarding all of that wisdom and knowledge so that they can keep control and power and domination over the world and guess what it's working in the archives at the vatican i never knew that this even existed these archives even existed like this is hidden information how do you guys feel about this did you know about this before what type of information is in there forbidden to visit the vatican's secret archives this area of the vatican serves as a massive storage space for many documents that we have no clue what they are it's the largest known collection of catholic books and literature there are letters from famous figures ranging from abraham lincoln to mary queen of scots these documents range all the way back to the 8th century most of the documents are located underground with over 53 miles of shelves it is forbidden for anyone to enter unless you have special access. Even with special access, there are multiple limitations on what you can actually see. Something kind of interesting is the current Pope Francis has announced next year he's going to allow documents to be accessed from the secret vault. These documents are related to Pope Pius and his connection to Hitler during World War II. There are so many conspiracy theories on what could actually be in these secret archives. They range from aliens, Illuminati, predicted apocalypse, and even the missing chronovisor. Like and follow for more videos like these. Vatican secret archives, now named the Vatican Apostolic Archives, house a Native American letter from 1887. The letter was written by the Ojibwe tribe of Grassy Lake, Ontario, present day Canada. The letter itself was written on a beautiful birch bark, a common method practiced by these Native Americans. And although I couldn't find the actual letter online, it probably looks something similar to this. The Ojibwe wrote this letter in May, but they charmingly date it to where there was much grass and the month of flowers. And it also addresses the Pope as the great master of prayer. The letter is entirely written in the Ojibwe language with a translation given in French by a Catholic missionary. In the letter, the Ojibwe people praise and thank God and also thank the Pope for sending a bishop to work among the Ojibwe people. Did you know? The Grand Grimoire is purported to be a secret book stored in the Vatican archives. It is considered a real book because the Vatican claims ownership of it, but has never allowed anyone to view its contents. Allegedly, 
The book was discovered in the tomb of Solomon in 1750, yet it bears the date, 1522. The author of the book, Honorius of Thebes, is said to be Satan himself, or possessed by Satan, for the purpose of writing the book. Some theorists suggest that the book possesses supernatural qualities, as it cannot be torn, burned, pierced, penetrated, or otherwise damaged or destroyed. It is claimed to be the only book containing the knowledge of a precise ritual for summoning Satan and other powerful demons. Additionally, the book is said to include precise information about the locations of biblical relics and even contains Satan's personal sketches of the faces of Judas Iscariot and Jesus Christ. The Grand Grim That is wild. So who is actually allowed within the Vatican secret archives? Well, qualified scholars from institutions of higher education pursuing scientific research with an adequate knowledge of archival research, uh, which, I mean, that's ridiculous. Who in the world do you know has freaking experience in archival research anymore? That's silly. May apply for an entry card. Scholars need an introductory letter by either a recognized institute of research or by a suitably qualified person in the field of historical research. Applicants need to specify their personal name and information as well as the purpose of their research. Undergraduate students are not admitted. There are strict limitations to what archive users are able to view and access. For example, no materials dated after 1939 are available for public viewing. Which is interesting, by the way, because that's the precise year that World War II started, which I'll mention later in the video. Now, there are 53 miles or 85 kilometers of shelf space in the library, and you must have a specific request to pursue that specific subject. There is no browsing permitted whatsoever. Instead, researchers request specific documents using bulky catalogs, which are usually handwritten in Italian or Latin, and they can only request up to three folders each day. If within just a few minutes they realize that the information that they're seeking is not in the requested folders, they're forced to pack up for the day, which is incredibly inconvenient and challenging for researchers and scholars because most of them are traveling incredibly long distances just to visit the Vatican secret archives. So you're only allowed to research what you know already exists. So anything else in there that, well, may not be known to the public, is not accessible whatsoever. I mean, come on, is that shady or what? And the fact that you can only request three folders per day, with even if in a couple minutes you realize like, oh, I have the wrong folder, I need the next one over. Oh, sorry, you have to leave for the day and request a new one. That's stupid, and, and tell me that's not indicative of hiding something, of something shady. I mean, think about that. What are they hiding in there? We're talking 53 miles of shelf space? Like, if I said five miles of shelf space, you'd be like, oh wow, that's a lot. 53 miles and you can only request what you know exists? Give me a break. Now there's tons of speculation on what they're hiding in there. Whether it's information about tying the Vatican to Nazi Germany, because there was some shady stuff there by the way. I mean, come on. You can't visit or view anything in the archives after 1939, the precise year that World War II starts. And there's already tons of evidence that ties various funding as well as the Vatican. You know, but I'll just leave it at that. I have a lot of questions. All I know is I don't have all the answers, but many speculate that there might be some answers related to World War II within the archives. So who is actually allowed within the Vatican secret archive? The Grand Grimoire is a secret book locked away in the Vatican archives. It is considered a real book because the Vatican claims ownership of it, although nobody has ever been allowed to glimpse its contents. Allegedly found in the tomb of Solomon in 1750, the book is inscribed with the date 1522. The man who wrote the book, Honorius of Thebes, was rumored to be Satan himself, or possessed by Satan to write it. Theorists propose that the book is supernatural and cannot be torn, burned, pierced, penetrated, or otherwise damaged or destroyed. It is believed to be the only book with the knowledge on how to summon Satan through a precise ritual and also provides instructions on summoning other powerful demons. Additionally, the book supposedly contains exact locations of biblical relics and even Satan's personal sketches of the faces of Judas Iscariot and Jesus Christ. The now, there's a difference between a grimoire, which is a witch's book of spells, 
and Malleus Maleficarum, or Hammer of the Witches. Let me explain the difference. First of all, a grimoire is a book of spells, how to do magic. And that is what this book is. Now, this is a printed, it is a printed book with instructions on magic. However, Malleus Maleficarum is what was used against witches. This book was printed in 1486. Malleus Maleficarum or Hammer of the Witches, the most sinister book ever written on demonology and witchcraft. Now, this is the witch hunting guide that was used from about 1500 till about 1750. This was the cause of over 100,000 people being put to death because they were accused of witchcraft. This told how to identify a witch, how to break spells, and then how to torture and get witches to confess or people accused of witchcraft to confess. That is Malleus Maleficarum. Do not confuse that with a grimoire, which is a book of spells. Here is a grimoire. This one is in French. Look how he's holding this it. This one is on true black magic. Right here. So there are, um, those are differences. Do not confuse the two. If you have any questions or you have any comments, let me know in the comments. To him for this. For a dozen Bibles in front of me in a variety of languages. And did you know, have you heard of the lost books of the Bible? I have over a dozen Bibles in front of me in a variety of languages. And did you know that out of these 13 Bibles, one of them has a book that is not in any of the others? What is that book and which Bible is that in? It is in this Bible right here that is from Ethiopia. It is in Gize. And if you look at that, you can see that this book talks about concepts of the original sin, fallen angels, demonology, the resurrection, and the final judgment. Well, the Book of Enoch is known in you know modern scholarly circles as part of the pseudepigrapha or false books. It's a book attributed to an author, but it was obviously written after that person was alive. It goes back over 2,000 years. But who was this character Enoch in the Bible? Well, Enoch was actually the great-grandfather of Noah, as in Noah's Ark, and technically the fifth great-grandson of Adam, as in Adam and Eve. So back in the early 1900s, Oxford University actually did a book on the translation of the Ethiopic book of Enoch. And you can take a little peek right there. So this is available for study, but... If you, if you take a deep dive and go down that rabbit hole, there are dozens and dozens of lost books of the Bible. Have you heard of the lost books of the Bible? Inside of this 400-year-old Bible, this is one of my latest acquisitions. Now, if you come look over my shoulder, we can get a closer look. I love the um, early spelling that you will see. The first book of Moses called Genesis. And on the opposite page... You have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and this is a woodcut. Um, there are very few illustrations in these early Bibles, but this is one of them. I think it's great. Now, this book, as we go through it, you'll notice I'm not using gloves because um, clean, dry hands is the international standard, and this paper, you can see, is not fragile. It makes a beautiful sound as you go through. This is almost like an ASMR but you'll see occasional woodcuts in the Bible. But like I said, there's not many. And after we make it through the Old Testament, we get to the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha was in early versions of the Bible, but it was taken out originally by this version, which is known as the Geneva Bible or the Bre Breaches Bible in 1640, but this is 1616, so it's still in here. The King James will not take out the Apocrypha until about 1885. Now, if we go forward a little bit, we will get to, here's the New Testament title page, and you can see 1616, and printer to the King's Most Excellent Majesty. This is when King James is the King of England. 
and um, the King James Bible has now been out for five years. One interesting note about the uh, this version of the Bible, it has 300,000 words of commentary in the margin. So, Breach's Bible or Geneva Bible is this version. And, um, yeah, I just love the feel of these older Bible. It kind of has this limp leather cover. But that is what a 400-year-old Bible looks like. To take a look, I'm going to show you. It's called a forage painting. Not just a forage painting, but a double forage painting. I'm going to split it in two, and then when I fold it, watch what happens. A picture appears. Now that is the crucifixion of Jesus. Guys, I am fascinated by these. It's just like, it's just so many different books. You're not going to believe what is inside this 200-year-old pocket Bible. Come take a look. I'm going to show you. It's called a forage painting. Not just a forage painting, but a double forage painting. I'm going to split it in two. And then when I fold it, watch what happens. A picture appears. Now that is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ depicted in the scriptures. And if I turn it around, it's amazing. The birth of Jesus Christ with Jesus in a manger in the shepherds. So that is called a forage painting. When you look at the Bible, it's hidden. But... When you open it, again, the, the picture appears, a story from the Bible. And on the other side, the crucifixion. So that is hidden. That is a hidden treasure inside of this 200-year-old Bible. The Ark of the Covenant is likely hidden away at the Vatican or at the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. There have been two major going theories in the Jewish community as to where the Ark of the Covenant is. One of them is that it's buried in the Temple Mount somewhere. They, the, the Jews saw the Romans coming and they're like, we are squirreling this away and the easiest place to put this is like somewhere underneath here, mm. which has been a going theory for a very long time. Wow. Uh, and then the secondary theory is that you guys have it. The, and, in the, that, at the Vatican? It's at the Vatican. Really? Uh, yeah, because, it, because there have been long-standing rumors that the Vatican inherited inherited much of the wealth of the Roman Empire. And so after the fall of Judea, a lot of that stuff ended up being kept by the Catholic Church. Wow. Because it's like you look, you go into the museums and you're like, oh, there's that, uh, you know, Raphael painting. But like, I don't know, man, you got the Ark of the Covenant. You're probably putting that in like the like the special locker. If somebody were to have it, the Catholics aren't a horrible bet, considering that when you go through Rome, one of my favorite things is where it's just like a giant Egyptian obelisk. And then boom, stick a cross on it. It's like, this is ours now. Could it be possible instead of building these lavish buildings, they just decided to build up as soon as they discovered this technology, however they did all the world fairs and stuff? What? You, you haven't heard about the world fairs? You want me to dive into the world fairs? Say less. All right, we're going to dive into those world fairs. But what I'm trying to say is, is look at the Tower of Babel and look how big it is compared to all these other buildings. Let's just say we don't know how these old Tartarian buildings got built. But if they use that same technology, instead of just doing these little fairs, having fun, let's say they used it for this tower. We now know exactly where... See, look, this is what I'm talking about. If this is the Tower of Babel, wouldn't it be like those old Tartarian buildings? What if they had that same technology, but they used it to build it up? It once was, and that it was in the country now known as Canada, but once known as part of Babylon. This is in Quebec, Canada. It's an ecological reserve known as Louis Babel. Someone claimed that it's a coincidence that it's named Babel. I don't believe in coincidence. If you read the book of Jasher, it tells you exactly what happened to the Tower of Babel after the nations were scattered across the earth. It says that one third of the Tower of Babel sank into the earth, which is where you get this indentation from. Another third was destroyed by fire, and the last third was left behind. 
But then in the book of Jubilees, it tells us that later on, the last third was blown away with a great wind. Now I'm sure right now a lot of you are saying, that's all the proof you have? It being named Babel and there being an indentation in the ground? That's not all. Remember how I said part of the tower was blown away? What if I told you that these stones, yes, also in Canada, were used to create the Tower of Babel? And that these giant, clearly cut stones were all over Canada? Now it also said that the Tower of Babel was approximately a three days walk. And if you use the radius and diameter to calculate the circumference of Lewis Babel, you'll find that it's a three day and three hour walk. And the extra three hours are really just on there because of the slight land erosion. I don't know, man. It, 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 for entertainment purposes only, it looked like that Canada, which y'all working on, it might be in there, man. It just, I'm just saying, it's, uh, the math is math and how the kids would say. What if I told you in 1893, there was a city in America that looked like this? Would you believe me? Well, this was the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. And this looks nothing like the Chicago that we know today. And you may be asking, what is the Chicago's World Fair? Apparently it was a celebration of the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival to the New World. It was also made to present the world's newest innovations, inventions, and ideas. They also tell us that these buildings were temporary and were only made for the fair. And just tell me, do these Greek Roman looking buildings look temporary to you? And just look at this structure. This was the mines and mining building at the World's Fair, one of the many magnificent structures and this was the agricultural building. Just look at the details of this temporary building. And this one is the manufacturers and liberal arts building. And this is the golden door transportation building. All of these buildings have insane amounts of detail. And keep in mind, there were 690 acres of buildings like these. All of these which were apparently temporary buildings. And come on, you're telling me these had to be destroyed because they're built on a lease? And come on, if you were building structures like this, you would not be building them on a lease just for a year. Many people believe these were the remains of an older and more advanced civilization. And that the people that write our history are trying to hide that from us. Let me know your thoughts on the Chicago World's Fair in the comments. I highly suggest that you do your own research on this topic too. Like and follow for more content like this. Hey, I have a conspiracy theory for you guys. So I don't know if you've ever heard of World Fairs. Um, but back in 1893, there was a World Fair held in Chicago. And these World Fairs were held all over the place. And there's many more just like this one I'm showing you. But the one that we're talking about right now is the one held in Chicago. These pictures you see right now, all these buildings that look like they belong in Europe or Rome or Greece. Um, these Roman-style buildings were all done and constructed in Chicago. There was an exposition called the World's Columbian Exposition. And the narrative is that it was held to celebrate Christopher Columbus's 400th uh, anniversary of finding America. And uh, supposedly they built these buildings in three years with $28 million. And it was for a fair that was meant to last six months. And, the, and then after this fair, these buildings were created to only be temporary. So like that bridge you see, the building in the back, all the statues, every building you see in these pictures were created to be temporary. It just doesn't make sense to me because I was always told that resources were scarce back then. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin around these times and here we are building stuff like this. What's the real kicker is these are people of horse and buggy. How in the they carry these buildings? All the material to build them anyways. Something just doesn't add up to me. If you guys want more information on this, I highly recommend you research the mud flood and the Tartarian Empire. The world fairs may have been a ruse to destroy the remnants of ancient advanced cities that formerly belonged to a previous empire we may know little about. The organizers might have ordered the destruction of the architecture on the grounds that after the fairs, it was necessary to dismantle the area, buildings and decorations. Localities like those chosen in San Francisco, according to the theory of the reset of the 1800s, were in fact cities built according to the typical imperial code of geometry and sacred engineering, with the intention that such structures would alter the state of mind of a new generation of inhabitants. If the great reset of the 1800s occurred as described, 
It would be logical to assume that some of the city's initial residents would have known that those magnificent monuments had been built, most likely by their ancestors, hundreds of years prior. Did the citizens of these cities not object against the destruction of these buildings? We can speculate that this is possible, but it is unlikely that we will learn whether anyone objected to the entire operation that was the World Fairs. The World Fairs may have... Let's question history. The 1893 Chicago World Fair, also known as the Columbian Exposition. It took place over an area of over 690 acres and was up and running for six months from May to October of 1893. And just look at the beauty of it. Wow. It truly looks more like it could be Rome or Athens. Good time to mention that they built all of this in less than three years, including all the canals, the lagoons, the statues, the parks, the bridges, the walkways, and of course the over 200 buildings. Now all of this was deliberately built to be temporary. They don't look that temporary to me. Only five buildings of the fair stand today. One of them is the Palace of Fine Arts, which was rebuilt with permanent materials in 1933. Which gets me to think, how does a building that is designed to be temporary and last six months stand for 39 years and is then rebuilt in permanent materials in a year? How? Of the other four buildings that survived, one of them is still in Chicago. The other three buildings were somehow transported to Brookline, Blue Mounds and Poland Springs. How? Well, how in general is the only question I have in mind looking at all of this. There's also electricity. In 1893, this entire fair was lit up. So the one question I have really is, how did we do that? And were those buildings possibly there before? I honestly don't know what to say. I'd love to hear your thoughts, but I'm just puzzled. Let's question history. The eight that video, but hey, good work. I love it. If you go behind Mount Rushmore and go just past Lincoln's head, you'll come across a secret hallway that is off limits to the public. Now, there are many theories about this room, but the true story is actually kind of sad. You see, the creator of Mount Rushmore made it his life's mission to construct a hall of records. And this was supposed to be a beautiful chamber with artifacts like the Constitution. But just as they started building it, World War II broke out and the project was canceled. Today, all that's left is an empty hallway that leads to nothing. There is a field in Virginia that is home to 42 abandoned presidential statues. These statues are about 20 feet tall and around 20,000 pounds. Now, internet legend claims that there is no explanation for this. That is not true. There 100% is. These heads used to be part of a tourist park in Williamsburg, Virginia from 2004 to 2010. Eventually, the park went bankrupt and the owner was tasked with taking them to a stone crusher to dispose of them. But he was a historian and just couldn't bring himself to do it. So he spent a ton of money to get them transported to his personal farm. Now, in order to actually move these things, he had to put a hole in the top of each statue to expose the metal brackets to lift them. And out of all the statues, only one fell during the entire process, leaving a huge hole in the back of the head. And ironically, that statue was Abraham Lincoln. If you go behind Mount Rushmore... Be cool. That definitely makes me want to go see it now. I've never seen it, but definitely going to add that on my bucket list. Did you guys know that?
Wow, we are behind. We got to catch up, y'all. We are behind. There's something very strange going on with the world's fairs. You are looking at rare archival photos that have been colorized. We are told that these extravagant buildings were built out of plaster in less than a year, only to be torn down shortly after the world's fair, never to be seen again. This is the Chicago World's Fair, held about 20 years after the Great Chicago Fire. In this same time period, almost every great city in the Americas experienced either a great fire or an earthquake that destroyed almost all of the old buildings there. Let me ask you something. Do these buildings look like plaster of Paris to you? How could simple plaster be strong enough and safe enough to hold up these giant domes and keep the integrity of the structure secure during the entire events of the fair? And why would all of this be torn down shortly after the fair? In a time where there was hardly any population on the outskirts of Chicago, where did they get the manpower to complete this? Something isn't right. There's... Something definitely isn't right. You can never find truth. All you can do is find false, drop it and get rid of it. And eventually when you can't get rid of any more false, what you're left with is the truth. How much false can you find? And there's lots in history. And I was looking around the internet and came across the images of the 1893 Chicago World Exposition. And it blew my mind because it looked like ancient Rome in the middle of downtown Chicago. And as I looked at it further, well, here's another one in Philadelphia. Here's another one in St. Louis, in Buffalo, in San Francisco. And then as soon as they were done, they tore them all down and threw them in the garbage. That just told me there's something wrong with all of these. The story of the expositions is, is a gigantic lie. And I think it's so huge of a lie because I think they're right at a bridge point when so many things about the 1800s that seem strange and weird, right as this sort of period ends of unbelievable strangeness and all of a sudden these fairs spring up all over the world with impossible buildings buildings we're talking about which are colossal structures chicago built 700 acres of fair in supposedly less than two years st louis built 1200 acres of exposition buildings one of the buildings in chicago the manufacturer's building would house 300,000 people there's a giant statue in the middle of the lagoon it was called the golden lady and it was known as the Statue of the Republic. It was 65 feet tall. They say it was covered in gold leaf that had copper underneath, but others speculate it was actually made out of solid gold. So you're talking 65 foot high, potentially solid gold statue. We're talking giant structures and looking like ancient Rome with towers and domes and columns and the most fine ornate pieces to them in these record unbelievable times. Then as soon as they're done, chuck them in the garbage. Like Jackson Park is a swamp. So supposedly they had to drive down tens of thousands of wooden stakes in order to support the weight of everything. They dug out massive lagoons, lakes. They had a canal system that ran through the entire exposition. They also had an above ground electric train. An electric train, well, where's the electricity coming from? That's running around the park. They had a moving walkway down by the shore. Not enough people are asking, where does this technology come from? Just to frame it, if I'm not mistaken, the Chicago Fair was the first time people had seen electric light. Tesla's the one who got the uh, electricity contract for the Chicago Exposition. And it was certainly more than all of the lights anyway that were in New York City at the time were at the Chicago Exposition. Now, it must have been mind-blowing for most of those people who had only seen gas light or candlelight at night to see that city lit up in such a way. Again, count the ways, it's 1901. We are told, whether it's true or not, the idea of being able to electrically do anything hasn't been around that long. And this fair is bizarre. This is supposed to be Tesla's fair, where he managed to somehow move electricity from Niagara Falls to Buffalo for the fair. No one's really explained how he actually did that. Uh, and at the middle of the fair is a 395-foot-high electrical tower. On top of which, of course, is a female golden statue called the Goddess of Light. And this thing was lit up by some suggest half a million electric light bulbs. Again, when you look at the photos of this thing, it's just, where do they really get the power from? I mean, think of what it would take Ether. today if you had a place with no electricity and no way to pipe it in, the generators that would have to be built. For example, there's a building that went up for the Barcelona Exposition in 1888. It was claimed to be the fastest built building in the world, 5,000 square meters, capacity for 2,000 guests, 600 rooms, 30 apartments, and it was supposed to be built in 53 days. 
This is supposed to be a time of horse and buggy. The two-year building times are actually impossible unless the two most likely theories would be either A, they had a technology that they're not supposed to have, and it really was built in that time frame. Even if they built them, they had to build them out of marble and stone in record time, or the buildings were already there. They'd been there for hundreds or thousands of years, fixed up, refurbished, repainted, hence the term whitewashed, which is the term that was used for the Chicago Exposition, which was paint all the buildings with this brand new spray paint that they had just developed to spray paint all the buildings in record time. So you couldn't tell if anything was old or anything was new. How long did these things tend to stay open? When they built these things, supposedly over two years, which is the narrative, how long were they there for oh, six open months. six months for the public to come? And then what was amazing, for example, in St. Louis, two days after the fair ended, they brought in a demolition team from Chicago with explosives and blew the thing up. They actually used dynamite to blow it up, and they say threw it in landfills. The things like the World Fairs shows there was a time in our past, and even not that far in our past, where humans seem to be at a completely higher level. Human living and human knowledge were constructed into the buildings using cymatics, using sacred geometry. These fairs, they're so important to study because the history that we know right now as history was invented at the time these fairs were going on. One of their underlying nefarious purposes was to teach a historical narrative to the population that they were supposed to believe and agree with. And scarily, the world we're walking into today is in some way has its origins during the time of these fairs. used to build the Tower of Babel. One thing I always get asked is, what do the interiors of these World's Fairs look like? Let's take a look at Paris, 1889. The World's Fair, most known for giving us the Eiffel Tower. And I could spend all day talking about the beautiful structures from the outside alone. But let's take a peek on the inside of some of these structures made with plywood and stucco temporarily made to last for only six months. They tell us it was made to look just like a movie set, from the outside only. And then we are presented with this, in these few shots alone. It's one of the reasons why I say they lie to us about everything. There's no way you're making this whole scene in two years time, only to tear it down in six months. Nothing about that would make sense. No slave labor or cheap labor is doing this for you. And again, I've said it several times, we couldn't build anything close to this today, temporarily or otherwise, let alone with horse and push cart. None of it makes sense. Look at our malls, look at our department stores. Most of them all in disrepair and vacant anyways, but did we ever come close to this? And yet, even in these magnificent temporary structures, there's signs of weathering and covering up of what used to be. Let's look at the floors down there. It seems like there once was a beautiful mosaic floor. Now it looks cracked and dirtied and worn, and yet hard enough to believe everything in this picture except pretty much the Eiffel Tower was Built to be torn down just six months later. And what's always the hardest to believe is after Paris was torn down, again after only six months, a few short years later, we got this in Chicago. Our history is nothing more than a set of lies. Wow, you can see that golden lady that they had made out of gold. Our history is nothing more than a set of lies. A set of lies they agreed upon. Question everything, friends. Until next time. What's good, world? The world's fairs. 
were one last time for the people to see the old world of Tartaria. After the world's fairs, they were destroyed, never to be seen again except for in pictures. It is the Great Reset. What's good, world? The world's fairs were one last time. These photos are a little different. He said this was the last time Tartaria said, look, this is our goodbye tour. And look at this palace looking structure. I can't Im imagine seeing that thing in person. Just the detail, you're gonna spend 30 minutes just looking at the building before you go inside. The Eiffel Tower of Paris, what lays beneath it, a structure from another time. The official story states the tower was built in 1889's World Fair to celebrate as Zion's French Revolution. In 1909, the Eiffel Tower bunker was used for military telecommunication. The bunker leads to underground tunnels. When the tower was built, they said that it will get taken down after 20 years. But why would you build the largest structure made to man just to take it down after 20 years? Plus, the whole military use for the bunker doesn't make sense. Why would you build something 20 years earlier preparing for war? This is a building before the previous mud flood and the bunker was once above land. Who built the Eiffel Tower? What's really going on with the Eiffel Tower? Tell me that don't look like a giant antenna signal. Is there video of that conducting electricity? Lightning Strikes Eiffel Tower, 1902, yes. Look at this. Man, lightning is striking the Eiffel Tower at the top, charging energy. They definitely charging something up under there for entertainment purposes only. But it's making sense they getting some ether up out of there. A rest of an exotic dancer. What is going on? The old world knew the healing. This is just one of the reasons why they removed the bells during World War II. The old world knew the healing properties of frequency and vibration. And that wouldn't do for this new world order we have. We must remain dependent on the petroleum-based medications that are prescribed to us, the addictive and deadly, with many side effects. But there was a better way. As Tesla said, if you want to know the secrets of the universe, you must think in terms of frequency and vibration. Just one more thing lost to us in our hidden history. Research the mud flood and fall of Tartaria. Dig up our past. Question everything, friends. had a lot more purposes behind them. 
from construction to healing, I think the bells of the old world had a lot more purposes behind them. From construction to healing, and they weren't just made for us little people. Just look at us little inheritors standing in front of this giant bell in Russia. Just look at some of them. Do you really think us with no power tools, no heavy lifting cranes, could have really created something this massive? There was such a focused effort to remove all these bells. They say it was for ammunition. But just look at the crowds and the controllers that gather around these bells as they're removed. They gotta make sure they take their picture in front of the cameras as the bells get removed. All with such glee in their face. Looks like this gentleman's documenting the specifics of that bell. And the group of well-dressed controllers looking on in a field of confiscated bells. See, that was a big part of these wars. They weren't just what they tell us they were. They were about removing the history and the technology of the old world, the true history. And bells were a big part of it. They were not just used to tell time or let you know church was starting. There's a storied history and use of these bells from healing with the frequency they cause to even construction. You can shape stone with sound. You can levitate stone with sound. And if you had a few giants ringing these, it would be all that much more easier. There are plenty of old world examples of sound not just shaping, but also destroying objects like the walls of Jericho. Brick by brick, bell by bell, they have removed all traces of our true history. Question everything, friends. Until next time. I think the bells of the old world had a lot more purpose. And these bells, the giants was ringing these bells. The reptilians couldn't shape shift because of the frequency of the bells. They couldn't stop them. They got these giants running around swinging these bells. The reptilians can't shape shift. It's because these bells, man, they couldn't stop them. They're like, all right, we got something for y'all. Y'all think y'all can say these reptilians think they can shape shift? Watch this. Ming 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 ming. Come on, y'all. We on the jet wave prototype. Let's go, y'all. And that sound and that feeling, that is the frequency and vibrations. What the old world used so predominantly and the true reason behind all the bells that magically disappeared or they tell us it was for ammunition for the wars. But many truths get lost in the fog of war, the healing and uplifting properties of bells have been used for generations. But it goes deeper than that. Moving us from the true nature of this realm, making us all that much easier to control. Question everything, friend. I had a dream that my grandfather told me the Holy Grail was never a cup. It was always...
fact. These are bells that were confiscated apparently during World War II and World War I. Look at the number of them. And I just can't believe they didn't show up more in the art, which is super weird to me. But I'm sure it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with this. Um, probably has nothing to do with the people in this photo that they're talking about. Here's an existing bell. It has a really interesting inscription. I'll run that through the Google Translate for you. So there's a fun little Easter egg. I'm sure that has nothing to do with this, right? Yeah. I know, I know, sh she's spitting. But man, those giants could have been holding them or it could have been flying now. The bells could have had the vibration and frequency to be flying. Oh my goodness. And probably nothing to do with these tiny castles either, right? But anyway, if you didn't know, now you know that the largest swinging bell is in Kentucky, where my ancestors also lived. Have a great day. What is this? The photo looks authentic and they, they call it a specific name. Like we can look it up. Can anybody confirm this? Used to hear these church bells everywhere. And when was the last time that you heard a lot of church bells ringing? Let's talk about influence of church bells on human health family. Research done by Soviet scientists discovered that the bells cured a lot of diseases family. Look at this, all of this one. And it even protects family, look. There were 80,000 churches, so the sound of one bell melted in the sound of another, which protected the country from major epidemics. And the oldest bell dates back to 1260. And don't forget family, 1260 was the time of Tartaria. It was the time that the people were living hundreds of years, even thousands of years. And after the year 1260, they started to silence the bells one by one. And now it's silence. And now health problem has become a norm. Um, all the weird and wonderful creations he's, he's made uh, to play this beautiful instrument, this 80-inch golden gong.
I ain't gonna lie, it feel a little bit good, you know? We need to hear those more often throughout town, man. These bells used to be heard all over town. Now, even if you listen carefully, even if you can still see the bell tower, the sound is lost after a few city blocks. So there you go. There's the difference between the acoustic world and the mechanical world. Half a block. A hundred years ago, they could talk about listening to the beautiful chimes of the Holy Rosary Cathedral in the Hillcrest area and also South Vancouver. You know how many miles away that is. A hundred years ago, Holy Rosary was one of the tallest buildings in the city. Today, it's lost in a concrete forest. If the ringing could be heard in Hillcrest, nearly 40 blocks away, then the acoustic profile of the bells has shrunk to less than a tenth of what it was. It sounds like they're trying to get rid of the bells, y'all. That's what it sounds like. The sound, the frequency, they don't want us to have anything to do with it. Guys, for these longer boys, if you made it this far, drop the 1000s in the comments so I know you're real. This one was a banger, man. I enjoyed this type of subject. You know, as far as I got from the old world Tartaria, these giants was carrying. Either some giants was running around, banging these bells, making some type of frequency, making the buildings pop up. They could have had some uh, microscopic uh, radiolaria type of uh, organism that could have been forming these structures. They could have been portaling these uh the materials to these portals that they had back in the day at those tartarian structures man it's so many questions and we're gonna have to dive in deeper on tomorrow's episode i hope you guys enjoyed the jet wave this is a you know a little upgrade you know we really on these waters man and i appreciate you guys thank you for helping me reach 5k the next step is 10k let's go baby you know i love y'all and i'm gonna see y'all on the next episode peace